He said he was. All right, welcome back to the Shop Class Podcast. Tonight, we're just doing a roundtable, show and tell, kind of end of the year. What are you guys up to? And uh, first up, Connor Malloy. How you doing, How you doing? Connor? How you doing, friends? All right. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, I'd love to share some insights and in kind of where we're at with our student building science competition, wallassembly.com. We took submissions. We've been open for submissions for the past uh, two months. And we had students from across North America submit to us uh, this past Saturday. So we have um, 11 final entries have been selected for judging for the event. So this year, we have over $16,000 in prizes as donated by our I mean, amazing sponsors. Some of that is education-based. Some of that is cash-based. So first prize gets 1000 cash plus their full ticket paid for getting their Certified Passive House Tradesperson's course, including their exam fees. And second prize, third prize, and fourth prize actually also get free training as well. And then what's really exciting about this year too is we've added, we had more money than we needed for the actual prize packages. So we were able to put together a bit of a scholarship fund. So we have about four and a half thousand dollars US. So what is that? 9,000 Canadian to, to give to students who have expressed a need um, to support a goal they have to grow into skilled trades, whether that be they want to get a pouch to work on site this summer, they want to get their carpentry ticket, and they need help with exam fees. We have one student who wants to start a nonprofit. You had someone on a couple weeks ago from RetroTech. The student wants to, they already have their own infrared camera, and they want to buy their own blower door wow. so they can go around their community and teach builders about air tightness, teach them about running blower door tests for diagnostics. So they want some support financially to help, you know, save towards buying a blower door. So awesome. the event's kind of grown into yes, sharing ideas around uh, building science and critiquing assemblies, but the students we're supporting this year will win just prizes, but also ways to support themselves in their career moving forward. So that's exciting. We got the entries in last Saturday and judging live judging happens on June 7th. So two and a half weeks. 7th. Yeah. All right. Uh, and it's such a cool thing. Are you going to do the, um, uh, the, like the layout of the, the judging, judgings? And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the way the judging will work this year. Where do, I'm so sorry. Where do I click on that? So click map? on, click on that blue, the blue tag there. See the okay. 2021 submissions. So what was kind of nice about, Miro. yeah, let nice about last year is we made all of the entries, all of the judges comments and all of their all of their marking is all still accessible. So students who entered the competition could go and see how a certain judge evaluated their work. Um, students this year can go back and see how the judges are largely the same this year. They've come back to support the competition, support the students. They can see how certain judges might have vote on certain assemblies, but also the more important part is this, this is a kind of like a markup software. So if a judge had a comment for a student, they could go on to their assembly basically take a digital sticky note and then write, write feedback. So these are all amazing people with, you know, professionals across North America who run their own companies, building companies or consultancies. Um, often they write for magazines like JLC journal, like construction, they write for fine home building, or they have their own on online training. So the feedback you get is really from the best in the industry and it's detailed, um, and very thoughtful. So all of this is really on this mirror board. So we're doing the same thing this year. Judges will log in um, this weekend when they start doing feedback. They will mark their own their own feedback on how they think that assembly performs against the rubric we have set up out of the six categories. And then they can all leave comments and feedback for each student. And then that'll be publicly available later once the actual judging is complete. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Because I mean, this year, the diversity in the assemblies we have, um, out of the 11 selected, four are from high schools um, in the U.S., one wow. from Colorado, Illinois, and then New York. There are... Oh, New York again. Yeah, New York again. There is um university from the West Coast of Canada. We have a couple from the East Coast of Canada from colleges and a lot from Ontario. And then some from Oregon and I think California. So like big it. diversity in the schools, 
both like the level of the school. So whether it's university, college or high school, but what's really, you know, quite nice is all the work is, is quite, is quite amazing. It doesn't matter what level of school you're from students in their classes, and their teachers have produced great stuff. So it's really exciting. That's great. And do you have the current interactive map published? No, we haven't published it yet. So ah. the judges haven't gotten it yet. We we just built the bracket yesterday, or I did last night. Ah, okay. So we got all the stuff Saturday. We've kind of filtered through it, selected the selected entries. We've built the board, but we haven't made it public yet because the judges haven't even seen it yet. So cool. they'll first do their comments, and then we'll make it public. But is, is that the first round, or is it just yeah. one one total situation? So the way it's going to work is this year we're actually moving away from the bracket style. If oh, okay. if we look at, so the way like the way the bracket started was it's a fun interactive piece. If two walls can go really head to head, like like any kind of match, yeah, and you decide a winner based on that match, because right. this is really student work with a more established grading rubric, it really comes down to who has the highest performing wall against the feedback, which really the highest score. So it comes down to, of the 11 walls, which one has the highest score? So they're all just in a single bracket right now. That's how it'll work. Oh, okay. What's okay. interesting is, the so the judges are going to judge the assemblies on a separate Excel sheet. They'll submit those to Travis and I, running the competition. We'll add them all up, so even the judges won't know who, who wins the assembly. We'll figure out who has the top four scores. And those top four assemblies, when we present them as the top four on the live show and then uh, reveal the winner, we want to present more information about those walls. So A, the students can learn about their own assembly and we can kind of have a dialogue. So um, Dan uh, Ederman from Rockwell, USA, they've offered to perform Woofy analysis, which is a thermal modeling on the assemblies. Wow. Super nerdy, super nerdy stuff, but really interesting, right? To see like how that wall manages water. How does it man manage, you know, thermal control? How does it manage, you know, thermal bridging? And all that we can't tell from a SketchUp model. You have to model it professionally. So Rockwell stepped up to to pay to have that done. Oh wow, that's amazing! Are you which serious? Which is which is incredible. And then a colleague of ours, and I mean, amazing person, uh, Chris Magwood, out of a school called the Endeavor Center. Um, he's been working with a group called Builders for Climate Action, and they've released a new tool called Beam B E A M which is an embodied carbon calculator. So we're looking at taking, yeah, look at beam tool. Yeah, beam calculator. Yeah. Uh, not that one. Um, put a comment and put builders for climate action. Sorry, builders for, yeah, builders for climate. No, uh, builders. Oh. Builders for climate action. So what the software it is, is it's an open source software. You can take any assembly that you've designed, even your own house, and plug it into this calculator and figure out how much embodied carbon did it take to produce your house. Um, so as we're talking about assemblies that are high performance, we're talking about walls that you know reduce how much heating demand we have in a house, so how much energy we use. So that's one way of looking at performance. But we have to go back and look at, well, how much energy did it take to make that thing that's really efficient. So we're gonna model the students' assemblies and figure out really how much carbon goes into producing their designs. And all that will be kind of shared and released on June 7th too. Okay, super nice this, question. This thing, this thing in itself is amazing and deserves some, some learning on itself. Let's, let's talk about it. That's my next question is, sure. can I put something in here and do a calculation? Yes. Yeah. So you, you could take your own home. So you can open the tool. It's amazing. Right. A, a oh. bit like PHPP where it's like a, um, it's a spreadsheet on steroids. And what they've done is they've spent the last few years researching by going to manufacturers and getting their product, their, uh, their product declarations. So someone like Rockwell will say to make this Rockwell bat, this is how much energy it took us in the factory. These are where the raw materials came from. So this bat shipped to your site. This is how much carbon it took to make it and get it to you. And then when you're selecting 
you know, that insulation product, you can tell the calculator how many square feet of the material do you have? And you can even choose if you know which rock wool factory it came from. Whoa. Because if it's come from the rock wool plant in Milton, Ontario, that's powered by hydroelectric power. So water, water-based electricity, right? Huh. Parts of the US, maybe it's coal-based. Um, so that'll impact the carbon score for that one material. So you can go through and actually calculate your own embodied carbon with a fair level of, of, of accuracy and then make some variations. So if you're building a house and you want to use um, structural insulated panels, you want to use um, insulated concrete forms, so ICF foundations, you want to use closed cell foam versus uh, rock wool or dense plaque cellulose, you can model all those materials and, and really figure out how much body carbon you have and make some decisions. So, is, so am I right in saying that this is embodied carbon is the stuff that's in the material but this is not a wall assembly heat or thermal estimator no it's not thermal at all it's okay. not thermal at all because so if you think about like thermal analysis we're talking about if we think about just a house a small house and we're doing performance modeling we're looking at how much energy does it take to heat and cool that structure and keep it at 70 degrees fahrenheit right 20 degrees celsius yeah. Yeah. How much does it take for your location with your sun exposure, your windows, your walls? What does it take? And that's the that's the, the heating load. And if you make some changes, you decrease that, you save some money, which is great. You save some energy. Wonderful. So that's that's how you can save operational carbon, right? Carbon it takes to produce the energy to heat and cool that structure. That's only one part of the equation we look at the carbon in a structure. To build that structure that saves energy, you could build the whole thing out of concrete if you wanted to. You can build the whole thing out of foam. You can build a log house and maybe make the walls thick enough to exceed that same insulation level. And those three houses, let's say they all produce the same energy savings. If the goal of energy savings is to reduce energy, we agree on that. And energy really is looking at reducing carbon. That's what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. So if the goal is reducing your carbon, your operational carbon, let's look at how much carbon took you to make that thing that saves energy right it saves operational carbon we can't we can't we can't yeah. ignore it anymore right so by modeling it we can determine how some houses over 50 years never actually save enough energy to pay off the carbon that they use to be constructed oh wow which blows your mind right what, so what would be an example of a material and i know nothing about this but like what would be an example of a material that would be carbon heavy on the scale of well so the, the, the three is high three is highest are the ones we use a lot so concrete steel and and petrochemical products so foam based products oh okay and then what would be a good example like a counter to that but would serve so so really light on the scale would be something like let's look at insulation look at dense pack cellulose which is recycled paper hmm. um even you know using wood-based beams versus steel-based beams in design you can look at, um, you know, wood-based windows versus vinyl windows. In siding, you can look at, again, a lot of cellulose-based products or wood-based products. So wood siding um, versus steel-based siding or concrete board siding. All these things are going to make an impact on your structure. Hmm. Interesting. Which is which is fascinating. So this tool just came out last month. We're going to see a lot more of it in the industry with uh, workshops and presentations and and fine home building. But it's an exciting tool that we're going to model the assemblies. So learn about their performance, but also what did it take to construct those assemblies? Because that's a big part of the discussion for us to share together. Yeah, wow. And this is uh, one of the things that I, I was trying to get one of my classes to do this. And you know, we I think we had break and we came back and we had that last week. And I wanted them to submit their you know little uh, paragraphs or their monologues yep. to one of the English teachers and just have them edit it and help us that way. And, you know, they didn't get it done. And I never went back to the site to, to see that it was extended if I had known, like. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. You know, you know I, I I looked at, okay, we have till the 30th or the 29th or whatever and needs to be in. And one of the kids was working on the SketchUp model and he's like, all right, I'll get it to you by seven o'clock that night. And we were just going to try to submit things. And, um, that was one of the things that they were, the kids were 
well, how do we figure out how much carbon it's taking? And like, so for next year, this this calculator is gonna. It's gonna be, be great. Helpful. Yeah, like the the impetus and thanks thanks for looking at supporting the competition with an entry. And it's gonna be here again next year. The we're not relying on the student to calculate their own embodied carbon to submit. It's just mm -hmm. to be aware of it. So when you're just like you're designing an engine, if you're looking at performance and you have to look at weight of the materials that you're using, you have to look at, can you source those materials? Can you easily get them to assemble them? Do your mechanics have the skills to put those together? This is all what we look at for an assembly. So embodied carbon is one piece of how we evaluate a wall. Um, how buildable that wall is, is important to know the cost of that wall. So, you know, maybe you can create an engine with 3000 horsepower, but if it costs $8 million, it's not really an effective tool. Um, so for us, this is the same thing we look at here. So embodied carbon is one of the lenses we use to evaluate, you know, this, the, the success of a, of a given wall. So bigger conversation next year, it'll be a bigger part of conversation of, I think all of our learning around built the built structures around us. And now there's a free tool to use, which is, which is wonderful. And how do I, is it, is it on the website? Can I? Yeah. So you click on that button, I think access beam. Okay. I think you can sign up and it'll send you the file. Get out of here. I think All they right. just want to track. They just want to track who has it. Yeah, that's cool. It's wonderful. Wow. All right. That's cool. Uh, yeah, let me just uh, sign up real quick and see if we can get it going. Yeah. So like on a small scale, I know you put together that, that mobile sauna last year. You could oh, no, that was. Um, oh, sorry. That was. Um, uh, Barber check. Barber check. Yeah. You know, you can model assembly like that. It's still it's still an assembly if those materials are in that calculator. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, it's as small as if you're doing a, a block foundation and one block that you're specking calls for rebar every, you know, 12 inches or 16 inches. You can pick the rebar size, how much rebar is in it, how much ties, and all that gets factored in. So it's pretty incredible. I mean, I, I think it's a cool idea. Uh, it would be cool to do this for all products. Um, you know, like uh, if you injection mold something versus uh, machine something, or if yep. you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you get something laser cut, but then it gets shipped across the country, and sure, you know, so there's like there's a lot to it, you know, and the packaging and stuff like that. You have to balance what you want. I know we had an issue with a client a couple of years ago. They wanted to use uh, Baltic birch, which is a, a a plywood material for making cabinets. And they they had a kind of a dilemma between they wanted to use one from an FSC forest, so a certified um, managed forest, but they also wanted it to be local. And the only local products were not FSC. So you get local products, but not FSC. And the only FSC products were from Russia at that point. So they could either ship products across on, an, on a container across the ocean to get FSC or order local. And it's this debate around for you and your goals, what is the most sustainable, right? It's for you to make that decision. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, like even, even with a Tesla, it's very, you could definitely argue like, okay, well, but you still had to mine all the materials and now you still have to get the electricity you know so you know there's the old tailpipe the longer tailpipe argument i i'm with i like electric cars but i do know that you are asking the grid to fill up your car and then you're also those materials so it'd be cool to like do a calculator like this especially with your house absolutely um, and, yeah yeah, yeah. Right. i mean basically it you know a lot of this stuff I feel like gets into a one or the other debate, but it's not, it's just information and options. So if you know how much carbon you're using, you might make a different choice. If that choice results in 5% yep. less carbon, great. But it might yep. end up being 50% less. Cause you might be like, oh, I didn't realize that was my biggest issue. And that's right. And you're like, okay, what's another option? And then the builder's like, well, you could use this. Oh, is it good? Yeah, it's good. But we just didn't think of it before or whatever. I don't know. It just allows you to make an informed decision, right? Yes. You can take the information that you can ignore it. 
you can act on it because sometimes it's surprising you know for us to order drywall so look at that for example ontario outside of toronto is a city called milton and one of the larger drywall plants certainteed that single plant has a drywall recycling program so they will collect drywall they shred the paper off they crush the gypsum they remake the sheets and they skin it again with paper so those sheets come out of that factory are 98 percent recycled if i order drywall from the other manufacturer which is just all virgin gypsum that sheet is five percent recycled the recycled content is just a craft paper on, on that sheet right so that those sheets cost the same amount of money same amount of money i just have to choose the right product that came from that factory big change so these calculators sometimes you don't have to make substantial changes to your assembly you just have to be more um just aware of where the stuff comes from and you can yeah. see over time the more that factory gets requests for materials they'll increase the size of that drywall recycling program it's, it's, it's a whole supply and demand right which is cool super I cool think we got it i think we got the calculator here did you yeah i think we're doing this bam i mean beam <laughs> beam bam all right so uh you want to walk us through this <laughs> i can try i've only used it twice about eight months ago i haven't done the walls we'll do yet it together we'll do it sure. together well, how about we do a brick yeah absolutely all right so, so you can go to foundation walls okay foundation walls okay okay so oh. you know we can look at this already looks cool i know you can take your assembly so I, I, like i don't know what it looks like on the screen because it's like a shared screen but like in person right here it looks pretty cool it's a really well formatted excel sheet right for excel like this excel looks pretty sheets. darn good i hate yeah. making them but once i finally make them like you can really be creative and like i know this is off topic but if you do like i have a side business but when you do an excel sheet you really see where your best effort is showing rewards yeah well you might not see it unless you did it out so this is kind of a similar situation and this is oh, what's okay. cool about it, right? Because this, this, I mean, it's an Excel sheet, right? But it feels more like software because of how well formatted it is. Yeah. So if you just scroll down those columns, this is the foundation category. Okay. So here we have Canada, Canada, Canada. I bet you if you go down, we have North America, North America. And then we have rebar sizes, US bar sizes. So if we're looking at, let's, let's, um, let's, let's look, look at your basement. Do you have, is is your basement concrete block? I'm looking behind you. Oh, this this is this is like a carriage house. Oh, it's a carriage house. Okay, but it's but like is a garage. it but, but but is it a CMU, a concrete masonry unit? Is it a block or is it poured? Uh, the walls, Ron, not the floor. Yeah, the oh, walls. No, those are those are cinder blocks. Cinder blocks. Okay. Yeah. CMU. So we can go right help. there. <laughs> so right there, you've got CMU. So co we call those concrete masonry units. All right. right. Team so go, go down oh, to, go. Yeah, right there. Yeah, so okay. scroll down. Right. And we've got eight inch blocks. We have. I'll tell you, hold on. Measuring tape where, where it was, is where it's supposed to be. That's amazing. I actually have it. All right, here we go. Is there uh, 16? Nice. In the height? No, uh, they're 16 wide. And they're, uh, they're like eight inches uh, tall. Eight inches, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that whole scene eight, was like eight. me going to my car and trying to tell you a car part. That was that was great. <laughs> I love that. I don't know anything about houses. Yeah. I'm telling you. Go 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 measure the manifold thing. Yeah, tell me tell me how big that is. I cannot tell you nothing. It has four tubes coming out of it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a pretty noisy thing. <laughs> do you need the do you need the the width, the depth? Well, so here's how it works. So what you would do like a standard for, size. for your for your home, you'd figure out how many square feet of block do you have in area? Oh. So we would just let, let, let's just say 10 square meters. So under the quantity in that column, so row 61 change that to uh, change that to 10. row 61 oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay here yeah this? 61 c yeah change that to 10. 
10. Yeah. Uh-oh. If you're trying to edit or protect yourself, please contact the spreadsheet owner. Oh, wait. Um, but wait a minute. I think it's because... But I clicked on that. Oh, why don't I just make a copy? Sure. sure. All right. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some way, but if I just make a copy, then I'm, then I'm good. I think. I don't know. Just in the interest of time. All right. Here we go. We're going back into. It's okay. If we, if we can't do it, what what it would do is if you put in the area for that material. Yeah. It'll tell you, you know, how many kilograms of carbon that block took to, to produce. So uh, net emissions. And if it's a material that actually stores CO2, like um, wood, wood fiber or cellulose, like how much you're storing. It. Right. So for 10 square meters of standard concrete block, and this would be looking at the industry average for Canada. There'll be one for the U.S. as well. So they take the the information from the manufacturers, they'll average them across the plants. So if you don't know the plant, this would be the average. So if you had 10 square meters, which is, what's that, uh, nine, about 100 square feet, okay. then net emissions would be 221 kilograms of CO2. Okay? Okay. So let's change that. So let's zero that out. Okay. Right in zero there. And let's go up to the top where we've got poured concrete walls. Let's scroll up here. So there's um, 25 MPA. Let's go to the eight inch wall. Uh, so it's wall, see the wall thickness. You can write in the thickness there. Here? Yeah. Oh, right, right. so at the top. See, there's an orange little box right above your cursor. Yeah, write in eight right beside it. Move, uh, your, cursor, move your cursor to the right. So this? Yep, they're right in okay. eight. All right. Great. Okay, Good. and then under that, yeah, then write 10. Okay. So you can see that poured concrete with a mixture of 14% fly ash and 25 MPA would be 651 kilograms of CO2. A lot more. Yeah. Now, granted, the block that we selected before, we didn't fill it. We have to fill it with concrete and then add the rebar to really oh. balance them. But you can see with that simple approach, you can actually you know diagnose your assembly create variations and just start to make some informed decisions yeah so they, they you could do this yourself but it would take a decade they did the work for you you just put in the they numbers. spent thousands of hours putting this together and reaching out to these manufacturers collecting all this information it's like yeah it's that's that's the bulk of the work and then it's making a system that you can simply plug in the thing and it pulls from this back end from all of these sheets that you can't see Oh my god it's just it's just incredible right and i'm sure they probably update it so this is like from a certain year and then maybe that's you get right it. that's right that's right and you know as as they get requests for more materials let's say there's there's a new manufacturer um let's say t-stud right in here yeah. if you go to wood framing go to exterior walls go to the tab at the bottom yeah so you can see there's light steel framing go down to light wood frame walls uh -huh. so there we have uh, so TGIs and spruce pine fir. So you put in, you know, what's the framing spacing? So 16 on center. And then you put the total amount of uh, material you have. So you can calculate the embodied carbon. So I should do that. Put in put in 10, just under row 18. Yeah. Okay. Just for fun to see what it does. Okay. So net emissions are, are 8 or 29 kilograms. And you can see, let's say in three years, been a big request for T-stud. They could reach out to Mark, reach out to uh, U.S. Engineer Woods, and get the product declaration. Figure out what it takes to manufacture a tea stud, and then put that in there. And the, you just you just be aware of that. Yeah, one of, your, awesome. one of your design tools. It's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, it, this is really cool. Um, I I hope they extend this to all products. So, like, if you're doing product design, or or let's say you're restoring a car or something like sure. that. Yeah, that would be cool to get this to, i mean i guess it's sort of difficult because that's sort of an endless topic i guess whereas this they sort of know what you might use for a house i think the big driver for this one is if we look at you know the biggest buckets for reducing um impact on climate 
it's looking at how we construct buildings and operational yeah. operational energy. So <clears throat> if you look at the amount of buildings we build in a given year and the fact that they they use 30% of all really CO2 production, this is a massive section for us to focus on. So if we oh. can make builders aware of the CO2 they're putting into their projects, it's just a good thing to be aware of. Now, do I have to... Yeah, of course. Now, over here, do I have to hit a uh, check on select? Yeah, so what you can do is you can let's you can build in different options. You can say, okay, what if I form it out of two by four or two by six? You can get the readout and then you can click which one you want the actual oh. summary to actually select. Yeah. And then so if, if I want the yeah. Don't go ahead. It, it, let's say I wanted the result. If I go here, yeah. This is the result. Oh, here it it, it yeah, then it would tell you, you know, per category and then give you a graph. I'm doing um, great, by the way. <laughs> it's great well you've got you got about eight studs so yeah you're doing you're doing great <laughs> right I got so it's really quite out. interesting to to compare different walls so this is almost like that you know when you buy food you get your uh, nutritional sticker on the side this is that kind of nutritional co2 and body carbon to figure out just being aware of what you're potentially proposing to build embodied carbon which i think is wonderful yeah, no, it's awesome. This is great. I, I appreciate you walking us through it. I mean, I uh, to be honest, it, when you first look at it, I feel like I'm looking at a kaleidoscope. You know, it's yep. like, you know, what's, what's really nice is it's organized um, in order of construction. So it starts oh. first with you know footings, oh, uh, slabs, foundation walls, oh, yeah. stair walls, floors, roofs, interior trim, wood flooring. You know, you, so you select. You know, a vinyl floor versus a wood floor, or you decide to polish the concrete with no floor. What does what what does that do to your interior? What is this part here? Project. Oh, so you put the name in. Oh, that's cool. Because huh. yeah, I'm not sure what that page is for. Again, I I explored a beta last year. I haven't actually played around with the fully the, this public launch version yet. Yeah, but I think it's so you can track your project information with your your areas. And maybe that helps to automate some of the cells. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Above grade yeah. conditioned, below. Oh, you know, maybe we could get Matt to do this for his house. That'd you be know? great. Yeah, It'd be I'll, super exciting. And he, I like, want to do it with you guys. I, I know nothing, and it's, but I still find it fun to go through the whole thing. You know, it's kind of you get to learn. I mean, even I'm just filling this living. in is is a way to learn. It's not so much like okay, yeah, you're gonna start with carbon. But like, right. how can you save carbon if you don't even know what you, why to count it or what category it goes in? You know. And if uh, it's you know if you're not passionate about this yet, I I I I feel that. But if you're if you're driven by building homes to make you know to make energy efficient homes, we have to be honest about what we're trying to do. If you're trying to save energy, you're really looking at saving carbon production. That's what we're talking about. So if that's what you're if that's what you're passionate about. You have to be passionate with the other part of the, of the carbon um, in the building, which is the embodied part. And then, the, the, then there should there. I would suggest one more cell, which would be like an earth, and then it takes the carbon that you added and puts it in there and tells you exactly how much temperature you ro rose up the earth on average. <laughs> I don't think we want to scare people, right? We can feel bad about themselves. Well, it's a tidy like, amount. I mean, it's a tidy amount, but it's like it's, and then uh, if you so if you, buildings... if you ever see that one, one of the collaborators, James Chris Magwood, has done some excellent presentations at the Fine Home Building Summit two years ago, and he goes through and shows some examples. Here's a standard home. Let's call it standard. A two by six wall, insulated with fiberglass, polyethylene vapor control layer. OSB on the outside, oriented strand board, right? Covered with Tyvek, strapping, vinyl siding, drywall on, drywall on the interior, specs out a foundation in a heating system and tells you how much embodied carbon that has and over its lifespan, what that saves against you know a typical structure. Yeah. Then he builds it three more times and shows you operationally what that does. If we make some small changes. You know, if you change where the concrete is from, you use a, like a high recycled, concrete so it takes uh fly ash or sorry it takes slag from the steel industry which is a waste product you use that 
to reduce the amount of Portland cement you use. Portland cement is incredibly carbon intensive. So if you can increase the slag in your concrete and use that instead, that's that's a no-brainer. That's a small change you can make, has very little cost increase, and you drop the operational carbon. If you look at the pink fiberglass and flip that to rock wool, which has a lower embodied carbon, it's still a bat. It still has, you know, relatively the same R value, has different benefits, right? But just from carbon perspective, it's better. And then we go to the siding, like you pick the small little hanging fruits and you can see what that does to the overall lifespan. Um, some buildings never pay for themselves in what energy they save. Wow. Based on how much, based on how much that's goes into the, this. That's the, the, the piece, so, right? That's it's kind of it's it kind right of humbling, right? If you've been building energy efficient structures that never pay for themselves in the savings, what are we doing? Right. Yeah, it's true. You know, what's kind of cool yeah. is like I've been discussing. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this because I think it's relevant. But I've been discussing what is engineering to my students lately, and. Uh, what I find is that nobody really knows what engineering is. It's like some people think it's like, oh, it's math or it's, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's working with uh, cars or something. You know, they don't know, you know. Yep. But I came up with a, with a phrase that I think really does it, and it's helpful for this, is that you're making a measurable benefit, right? So you're, you're measuring something, then you're using creativity and inform decisions like you like you said to make some sort of change that is a measurable benefit in the end when you bring it all out like you said what is the end result not just what you're doing with the thermal but what about what it what it how much carbon did it cost to even make the building plus its lifespan put it all together and now you have a baseline then you do what, what you said about this guy yeah. who changes a bunch of things and he uses some creativity. He says, well, do we have to use this? What if we use this? What if we use this? What if we invent a product like Rockwell, come up with something new? Yeah. And to me, that's engineering. And so the kids still, if they don't get it, what I say is, well, how about if you're an athlete, right? You're an athlete. You measure your uh, you know, your, your calorie intake and your power and, and how much you weigh and all this stuff. And then you make some sort of change to the to your training or to your diet, and now you have a different result six months later. To me, it's basically science, but with athleticism, like a goal in mind. Sure. You know, and this is a great tool to allow you to do some engineering, whether whether you're for the climate or not, or does, none of this matters. What matters is, are you trying to make a benefit that you can measure? Yep. And and then if you could benefit us all by Reducing the carbon, that's a win right there, you know? It's wonderful, right? Yeah, totally. Definitely. Cool. This is great. Yeah. That's exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. Fun, fun to work on and great to collaborate, great to support student efforts. And so, yeah, June 7th, we can tune in and see who wins and gets money and gets training and and who we give scholarship funding to. Nice. Uh, it's yeah. awesome. Thanks for doing all the work no, you're thanks doing for, about Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, no problem. All right, cool. So, uh uh, Connor, you can stick around, or if you got to go, it's no problem. Whatever sure. you want to do. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Um, uh, let's get over to, uh, yeah, so uh, either Nick or Duke or Evan, whatever you guys want to share with us, we're going to we're gonna move into that direction. Let me see here. Who's ready to go? Nick, you want to talk to us about it? All right, let's, let's, go, to, let's go to the, the what, what did you make, a cooker? Oh, my God. I got to see this thing. Connor, what, yeah. what kind of, what, what are the majority of the drawing tools kids are using to draw the walls? So this year, predominantly, it's it's SketchUp. Um, yeah. That's usually the tool people select. Yeah. Vic, is that what you were using? It is. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, we normally use Fusion to to do things, but you know, when we were talking about this originally, you know, back in what March probably here on podcast, and then uh, with Mark coming on and talking about that as well, you know, Mark, these studs are on SketchUp and everything. So I think it was 
most of these kids that I had doing this were from last year. And when we, mm -hmm. when we were virtual, I couldn't do uh, fusion at home and at school, you know, teaching remotely like that. So I had them using SketchUp. And I personally am having issues with SketchUp, just the interface, because I'm, I, I've come from Autodesk training, you know, from high school yep. to current. So that's my universe of choice. But, you know, the kids picked it up quite easily. And the few that I had this year that were last year's students, yeah, we'll jump right on it. And they were, you know, searching up the, the little universe or the warehouse or whatever the uh, SketchUp calls it and finding, you know, zips and piece studs and uh, floor joists, and then uh, the insulation, you know, so I had the one kid drawing it up and the, the other kids in the class were, all right, well, let's add this here. And, you know, he was the model, model guy. So we were using SketchUp for it. You know, for this, for this application, I was finding, you know, it's a very easy visual, you know, for that little snippet of the wall section. Yeah, every couple of years I'll try to jump on like a different drawing program and like mm -hmm. take a tutorial or a course, whatever they call it. Yeah. So then uh this year it was SketchUp. I haven't taken a SketchUp course in a while. But they got a pretty nice campus. They're uh campus uh tutorials. Yeah. Where you can start with drawing just a uh a playground, but then they have like architectural suites that you can go by and they have a bunch of tutorials uh you can go through. They have curriculum through the SketchUp for educators, right? But then uh, I keep getting stuff from Onshape. Though I did a little bit of Onshape last year. I like Onshape. Uh, you know, Onshape's good because in real time, you can make changes over the internet. Basically, you could have like ten people or like a whole class working on one assembly, and then. Or like if you're like, hey, you gotta make these changes, and then you like go in and they see you doing it in real time, and you can do it from your phone too, you know. So that's a kind of a cool thing. I, it worked really well during the pandemic when we were home. Oh my god, uh, it's all works not so much because I mean maybe they got some new feature now, but you couldn't just go online, and my kids don't have, you know super duper computers at their house it's like a, their apartments this is like an urban neighborhood so you know this was different this was a uh on shape was like a hero in that scenario and that plus they got an education feature called um uh, uh uh enterprise and they'll give you access and then you can actually see every pen stroke every click of the mouse that a kid does and then this way, if they hand in some work, you can figure out you can figure out if they copied it, like if they copied the model over or something. So you never have to, yeah, it's 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 you're really helpful. So I teach middle school, so Tinker CAD seems to work for me. You know, it's yeah. just, it, it's nice and simple. It's easy for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders to use. It just seems like. There's such a big gap between Tinkercad yeah. and Fusion, Tinkercad and SketchUp, Tinkercad and uh, Onshape, and it's you know it's it's not it's not for every middle school kid those three, mm -hmm. but Tinkercad, every kid can draw on Tinkercad. Yeah, that's great. That's good. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, let's get over to what what is this thing, Nick? Uh, all right, so <laughs> the story starts 10 years ago when I traded a, uh, a landscape or a, a deck over type uh, trailer. It was more of a landscape trailer. That it, it more looked like a uh, snowmobile trailer that became a deck over landscape trailer. And I found somebody on Craigslist that was looking to trade this for a flatbed landscape trailer that they wanted to make an outdoor kitchen out of. So I traded my trailer for this and my brother-in-law and I and uh, a colleague have been sharing this trailer all these years. And uh, you know, I've modified it here and there throughout the years. And last year I took it to Maker's Camp for Wilshire and 
um, Chris from Green Money Fab to use to make the, uh, the last day barbecue or the last night barbecue. So that guy, William Shear, he, he's a, William Shear is a chef by trade. And if you scroll through his page, he had gotten a uh, professional um, smoker like right before Maker's Camp last year as well. So he had his smoker and my smoker. He was making the chicken on my smoker and then on his smoker, he did the ribs and the brisket, I believe. Um, so, you know, they gave me cues and, you know, suggestions on what I could do to modify this. Um, my smoker, um, mine originally came with two two inch um, smoke pipes or uh, chimneys on it. And it was very restrictive during the uh, the event. And uh, so looking at Chris's uh, expertise, um, Chris actually works at the same school district as the gentleman that we had on from Jersey. What oh. was his name? Uh, he's your- uh, Frank? Yeah. He's they both work in the same school. Oh, and, uh, uh, Roxbury. Yeah. So they were both work in the same school. I'm going to see uh, them all tomorrow for an awards dinner. And uh, so Chris, you know, he makes smokers on the side out of propane tanks and looking at his page and getting suggestions from him, you know, this is the better way to have a, a chimney put on and collector, you know, to get all the, the blue gases out because uh, having the smaller exhaust was restricting it and it wasn't getting up the temperature and everything so is this um, what you're talking about yeah so he takes propane tanks he's got and uh he makes these professional smokers jesus so those his smoke boxes are uh or his fire boxes are all insulated so the, there's an inner fire box and then like two or three inches of fiberglass insulation or uh like uh what do you call it uh firewall in there and it, it keeps the the firebox much more even more of an even heat throughout the, the smoke time where mine isn't so I, I get the variations if it starts to die die down and everything so eventually i'll probably you know bump mine up to insulate the firebox and everything but so it's been uh in a little bit of an adventure you yeah, know everything cool. I, I just did to it that was all metal i already had didn't have to purchase anything um my smoke stack was from the the uh last renovation my school had they were getting rid of the, the big projector screen that was the the tube that was in the the center of the projector so it's a six inch pipe it's six feet tall now and with my size firebox, I can get the the uh, smoke chamber up to 250, 275, which is a little high, but you know I can just dial that back with the airflow in. So, and uh, good. I was looking at the food. I'm mostly vegetarian, but I look pretty good. <laughs> we, you know, is when someone takes the time to smoke the meat. Oh my God. Now, is this like a uh, foldable stack? Is that what's going on yeah. here? Yeah. Does this, so seal, I, how do you seal that? Does it work pretty good? Oh, I guess because of the airflow, it's not trying, it's, no, it's not pressurized. So, no, well, that's the thing. I, I do have a, a beam clamp that I clamp where, like, your cursor is just to hold that while it's, it's upright. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it really does have enough good draw that I really don't probably need it. But, so oh, it cool. It's got a little, uh, yeah. So the drill bit, the auger bit, this, um, uh, brace bit that I put on there. Oh, that's the counterbalance to that. That's the no, that's the lever. Open up the damper oh. on the top. It's connected to the rod and everything. Like a, like a trucker, like, <laughs> you know, What's one of my neighbors gave me it's a bunch of bits cool. and, uh, this one was all rusty, and I, I'm like, all right, I'll use this. But I go and cut the tip off, and then I, oh, let me wire wheel it. I wire wheel it, and there's a, a patent date on this 
shank of the set from 1881. I'm like, oh crap. 1881. I, you know, I've got a few of these at the shop. I should look at the patent dates. Oh my god, it's amazing. What? How? What? This bit. What? What do you hook that into? Like, what is the chuck for that? I've never. I have these bits, but I have no chuck for that. What? My stupid. What, where does that go into? It's a bit and brace. So the brace. Um. What? Collet or chuck? I guess it, it's if you type in bit and brace in Google, you'll you'll see the handle thing. You basically either put it against your your stomach or you put your hand against it and you crank with the other hand. It is rationable. Bit and brace. Oh yeah. So that's, so it'll you know, fit in those. Yeah. Oh, we got a few of those. What's up, Mark? You're muted, Mark. Oh, he's just getting, he's, he's warming up here. Oh, sorry. I said, I said, Nick, those are the drills that don't need a cord or a battery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just before you got on, Mark, I was, I was describing the handle that I put on that, that drill bit that I put on for a handle. I was saying, you know, a neighbor of mine gave me a bunch of those and that one was all rusty. I'm like, oh, this looks perfect. I cut the tip off and then I wire wheeled it and the patent date on the bit 1881. I'm like, oh crap. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, now that grill is worth a lot of money. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Maybe, maybe you need to uh, get a little fancy signage on the side of that grill and call it the one eight eight one eight eight one. There you go. And what? And anyone, if anyone asks what it means, just uh, <laughs> just tell them it's the year you graduate high school. <laughs> what's um, up? Connor? What? I said, what's up, Connor? There you go. How you doing, Mark? Yeah, nice to see you. Well. You too, buddy. Dude, uh, uh, Connor gave us like a super tour of, um, like I get, talked we got, about, talked about Sweet 16, talked about uh, woofy modeling, talked about beam doing embodied carbon analysis, lots of super nerdy, exciting things. So that was great to share the new beam tool. Yeah, I had, uh, I had Chris on, uh, again last Friday with the, the launch of it uh it's just uh, incredible so yeah, the, were, you, were you were you part of the test run group of this then connor yeah so we ran it last year for the right. first student version of sweet 16 so we got to play around with the with the beta tool yeah and then chris gave me a copy of it so when i did some planning last year on a personal project i ran scenarios and it was that was the beta when it wasn't complete but man it's just a wonderful design tool is there a is there a, a a t stud in there? I was telling the boys there isn't yet. So if I think if you guys have your product declaration, your information, um, then they could look at adding something. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, I don't. I mean, it'd be interesting to do right because it's just taking a two by three and then. That's it. It's it's a weird approach for engineered wood. Do they have LSL or LVL in there? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they they would I think they'd look at I don't know their exact analysis, but they look at, you know, in a T stud, what how much energy goes into manufacturing the dowels to then put the assembly together. And then where does that energy come from? Are you pulling from a grid that is hydroelectric based, nuclear based, coal based? Because that'll affect um you know the co2 for your product i was saying to the gentleman here if you look at the rock wool product depending on which plant it comes from it's going to be on a different grid so the rock wool, right. the rock wool plant in milton pulls off the niagara falls hydroelectric dam so that's a pretty right. clean uh way to produce not every one of their plants comes off a clean grid and that's going to affect the carbon in the same bat depending on where it comes from so all that stuff is super interesting to, to, to learn about. You know, uh, 
I wanna, I wanna, how many people are on? I don't wanna. No, go ahead. I it's just say, right uh, so it's funny what you just said. And I always thought that kind of because, like, okay, you know, say if you're near Hoover or whatever dam you're, you, you're, you're near, you're getting the, the hydroelectric. So yours is cleaner. Um, so it's not true because the grids interconnected. Sure. Yeah. So it, it, in a way, these the folks that are by that grid saying that it's cleaner, it's not. Yeah, but but so, for us, but for us up here, the majority of our use is going to come from local. So you look at the production. My understanding is, electricity will take the least path resistance. So you, in fact, are going to use power produced more locally because of that transmission. Uh it, it, yeah, it does in the local, but it's a, I guess I'm saying it's a false nomer to think that it's, it's clean uh, because it's all dirty is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, so maybe, maybe you look at it as a country as an average, you look at your energy production as a country and say for this factory. So Rockwell produces in a few places, you look at LVL too. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the power grid in Germany, um, it is... It has more coal production than we do. Uh, we have a heavy use on nuclear and hydro. Right. Um, the states, I'm not sure what, what 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 the mix is, but maybe they use an average. That's a great question for Chris on how they pull those 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 that that data. Yeah, I have to think. Um, so our plant is in just um, on my scale. Our plant is in Iowa, and I got to think that Iowa is nuclear and coal i would say mm -hmm. right but that's worth that's worth that's worth checking out but then the mills that we get the two by threes and two by fours that's the other factor and the shipping from those mills to us right that right, whole yeah. embodied carbon which is which is why we need to be in maine or or british columbia not right I, right. So are you produce are you shipping by rail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get all our two by threes and two by fours, you know, like everyone else. We get them from Maine or from uh yeah. British Columbia. Gotcha. Uh so so the rail aspect, getting it to Iowa is easy peasy. That's not a big thing. Uh but then and, and our dolls are made right there too. I'll bet it'd be really interesting. Uh you want to look up something crazy, Ron? Look up, um, look up on Duke's gonna Duke's gonna kick me in the teeth. Look up the the uh, the Maytag facility. Did we do this before, Nick? The Maytag facility in Newton, Iowa. Oh, that's that's where we we make these, Connor. Yeah. Uh, like this is the biggest facility I've ever been in my life, and uh, there's acres of 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 wind turbines sitting there i think i think we did this once before yeah. didn't we yeah um craziness uh okay chris chris magwood you'd almost think that someone would try and take him out for giving this technology away <laughs> um and, and i actually uh, the other the other thing about about it is um you know what happens when you give someone something for free, then they come back and then they borrow your chainsaw, right? And then they yep. want to borrow your weed whacker, right? They want sure. to keep borrowing stuff. Uh, that's why Nick has a 14 foot wall around his property now. <laughs> uh, but like the, it's, it's a duty for us to find like, you know, the Heinz family or someone and say, okay, see, because they developed this and put it out there. Now we know that we need to sponsor that and support it. We need like some some cool cat that's a carbon disaster to turn around and sponsor that to help make themselves feel shiny and new. Yeah. What about where's Rockwell in here? Am I right looking at this right? Would it yep. be here? That's, that's narrow wool. Yeah. That's it. Yep. And yeah. So you see I there, think? there's there's different manufacturers. So well, that's all Comfort Bat. So Comfort Bat oh, is Rockwell. Oh, here we go. But the thermofiber is Owens Corning. Right. Uh, 
So manufacturer to manufacturer, you can see the difference there. And then uh, where is the difference? Oh, so let's just put 10 down the line here. You know, I could pull it probably, but. Who's typing? Is that you typing, Ron? Yeah. My... <laughs> what, am I doing this right? No, so, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that you were driving the bus right on. I think we have to go up to the top and give it the um there you go. Oh. go to the top there to go with the scroll up then you have to give it the stud spacing. Oh. I think it needs another metric to give you the, the information. Okay. Uh again, I still have to play with this a lot more to section tell you. complete. No, because it's no. it needs to pull another number. Um, okay. Um, all right. No, no problem. Oh, uh, there, there you go. Go down. Oh. Fill volume. No, go down. Go down. Oh. So, you. Well, that's you flip to party walls. Go back to. R oh, cavity insulation. Yeah, there you go. So value. choose the R value. Uh, you guys tell me. So. Go, go twenty. Yeah, twenty. Okay. Oh, here we go. Ooh, big difference. Wow. And, and, and Chris, and Chris, cool Chris talked about this when he was on the show last year. He was talking about this example, just looking at you know, mineral bat is not all born equal. It does come down to where that plant is located, where they get the materials from, how they produce it, and all that impacted their their net emissions. And this comes from the company's own declarations. So. All very interesting. So maybe you, you know, if you have the choice, equal cost, equal timeline, maybe you choose a rock wool comfort bat product because of this this information. And maybe you don't. But now, you know, like the trust and verify with blower doors, you now have a metric that is accurate and is measurable. So hmm. you can decide to use it or 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 or, or not. Right. It, 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 it's amazing to see that difference. And I wonder how much of that is that grid base. Cause the Owens Corning is what Indiana and Rockwell is like Virginia. And um, what is it? The other one, Alberta, maybe that's right. And, and well, there's a big plant in Milton for Rockwell for us. That's just in Ontario outside Toronto. Oh. Yeah. We have a big plant. So yeah, he was talking about the exact exact example because they were blown away by some of the numbers. They went back and figured, well, why is this number three times over three times higher? Because they thought the numbers were wrong. And I forget the exact insights, but he went through the ins and outs of these examples and these comparisons. Can yeah. you, while you have it there, can you put the ten at that Havelock wool, the four point four loose fill one? Uh, go up, go row, up. Row seventy eight. Yeah, row seventy eight. Thank you. Just, just to sit. This is, this is, this is shaved off the back of sheep, right? Sheep have to eat a lot of freaking grass to do this, and then it, it goes, uh, it goes on a big kite. They send kites over from New Zealand to uh, <laughs> Nevada, and then Nevada harnesses the kites and brings them some down. So that's twenty-seven. The net emissions for Baba Black sheep is twenty-seven. Wow. Ah. So here, so we'll look at the other thing that's happening here. You've got this other part now you triggered with the uh the, the CO2 storage. So yeah. certain certain materials they deem based on their structure as uh, yeah. CO2 storing. Oh gotcha. Because it took in more uh right. to make it. That's right. And you're storing because you're now gonna store it in a building and use that as insulation versus let it decompose or you know, in case of wood products and burn it. So it's fascinating here, which things can be, so you can have some buildings, you can look at their, their final scores. And if you go to the natural building side, you know, straw built walls with hempcrete insulation or natural clay plasters, you can have a, a building that has net carbon. Oh, there's the hempcrete. Straw bell. <laughs> oh my God. Negative. Negative, negative, right? So you could have a building with net negative embodied carbon. Wow. It, and it meets ICC fire code. Huh. 
it's, it's also a great way to collect mouse droppings. Yep, and go go go, 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 go put, it, put it put it in hempcrete. Put in ten into hempcrete. Row one fifteen. Got it. Oh, I know what I'm going to ask for next. This is fun. Oh my god, hemp. That's what. That's what. Didn't uh, William Randall Hearst try and ban this because it was going to take out his paper making operation or something? There's a lot of people went against this because it was a good product and they didn't yep. want people growing it. Can you type in uh, line 123 now? Um, yes, I can give us the, the phone. Oh, just... DuPont XVS. Yeah. yeah. Survey says. Ding. Uh -oh. oh, we oh, put in the, the our values. Put it, we're putting in twenty. Put in the same value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Oh. no, just a swing of about two thousand. So Rockwell was sixty, and this is two thousand. That's when Matt Damon says, "How do you like them apples?" <laughs> So remember, you know, back what we talked about earlier around you know, if your goal of your structure is to reduce the operating energy it takes to run it, we have to admit that that's to save energy production, which is really about carbon production. So we go yeah. back to the building. If you build this building out of completely foam, yes, it could save. Let's say this saves the same energy as a as a straw bale straw bale based building. So they save the same energy. Look at the embodied energy it takes to produce the thing that saves energy. This is why we said earlier, Chris's presentations have shared that some buildings over 25 and 50 year lifespans never actual pay. They never pay back the carbon and savings that it took to physically construct them, which blows your mind, right? So if the yeah. whole goal is to build buildings that are more efficient, we have to be cognizant of the embodied energy it takes to produce them. There was uh, there was one there of spray foam uh, that the close off spray foam. It'd be an insulation. So go uh, down. No, so go up. Go up. Mineral wall, mineral wall. That's bad. There, there you go. So close line out. 242. Yep. Yeah. This will be really interesting. But I have to so go up and put in the R value. Yeah, 20. Oh, isn't that interesting? That is it's fascinating, not as, isn't it? It's not. It, it's a fifth of what XPS is. Yeah, I don't know why. Again, we need, we need, we need like Chris just to pepper him with questions. No, wait, wait, no, no. Hold on a second. Can you do the backstory? Like, what? Where's the thing? Like, where am I? Where's it going to? Okay, so the 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 difference. My speculation is is the XPS sits on a truck right a four by eight sheet full of air and gets carted around versus right. sp uh spray spray foam is a 55 gallon drum right it's like shipping detergent without water yep. and then it's just uh mixed a and b on the site uh with a with a with a gun um in a heated truck so that is a colossal difference. Holy Huge difference. crap. Huge difference. And that was between, where was I before? Exterior walls? Yeah, you were down lower in uh, sheet-based continuous insulation with that 2,000 number. Yeah, where was that? I think you were up. Right. But I'm on exterior wall tab? It was down. It was down. I think you deleted the cell. So go down. Oh. It was down around row 170, I think. Oh. Stop. Stop. Sorry. Go up. Yeah. Their XPS board. How did it get deleted? I didn't. I don't know. So okay. it's the DuPont line. Uh, no. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's weird. I don't know how this got deleted. This might be a different. Different section? No, yeah. we did have XPS before. Well, wait a minute. So, because like, if you look, if you go to foundation walls, it also handles insulation, and then this yeah. is exterior walls. What's the difference between foundation walls and exterior walls? So, foundation is foundation is uh, below grade. 
So oh. they'll they'll organize materials as insulin materials that respect for below grades. So maybe Owens Corning makes, you know, so Rockwell makes um, a, a Rockwell board called Drain Board, designed mm. for below grade applications that'll only be found, I think, in the foundation category, mm. and then Comfort Board, um, will be in the exterior wall category, so above grade finishes. Yeah, interesting. Man, you learned so much. Oh my god, these are it's so awesome that you guys come on here and talk about this stuff. It's just like I wouldn't even know about this. Um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah, so cool. But do they give you like? Uh, do they let you behind the behind the curtain and let you know, like, all right, this is where we got our numbers from? I mean, I, you could go and look it up, look up every single company, but I, I imagine on their site somewhere, and I can ask this to Chris next time, is they probably organize the product declarations to show their data. I think their whole point of an open source tool for you to use is to have complete transparency. Uh, but I'm unsure how you actually pull up that information. But I'm sure yeah. it, it is available. For instance, on LinkedIn. Um... You know, he 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 had this up, and someone you know from the spray foam thing, they hyped up right away, and they said, "Where did you get this from?" Blah blah. blah. You know, someone puffed their chest right away. Yeah. So, so Chris comes from the building community. And he's obviously highly analytical, and he's just using data that's out there. So he says, "I'm glad you asked. It's from the spray foam." council right the people that publish and and do it for the industry is like it's yeah. from your group right yeah. and uh and then of course all of a sudden the guy ate his ate his lunch right, Silent, right? quiet yeah. oh here it is there's your thing now does this use your zip code great question maybe that's what they put in when you put in your information i'm not sure huh. again i'd learn more about it by actually using it more now that's oh, it's released. Yeah, no, great question. Take into account like manufacturers from like the uh, foam board that Mark was talking about. Maybe that's how they get the carbon footprint because it travels. <laughs> if it has to travel from Canada to New Jersey, that's a big a greater distance. Then no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's totally has to be a factor in the embodied carbon is that transportation, not just the transportation to produce, but the transportation oh, to probably. destination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. So I want to maybe we'll do this with Matt. I was saying, Mark, I was saying to Connor, we should do. Uh, we should we'll we should plug this. in his house twenty eight. But if I, oh, here we go. Huh. So, Mark, I was saying, so the top four assemblies from this year's competition will be modeled in Woofy Passive. Um, so that's being paid by, well, done uh, free from Rockwell. Rockwell's going to Woofy model the top four assemblies so we can share and learn more about them. The students can learn more about their work. And then we're going to model them in, in Beam as well. Just, just as a conversation tool. So uh, that's done by Robert Robert Blunt, or I think so. That's right. I think yeah. so. They have a great team over there. Uh, Rockwell is like none other when it comes towards uh, transparency. Oh, it's incredible! They're such they're such a great partner. They get a lot of bad press because they 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 didn't shut down their their Russia facility. Uh, at the end of the day, people need insulation. Sure. Especially these days when you can't get anything else. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what uh, about new construction? So the first four, huh? Um, how many, how many, can you tell us how many people entered this year? Or is that not public so, yet? Well, yes, yeah, so we have, we had 16 submissions. Okay. Oh, whittle those down to eleven that met the criteria, so we have oh, okay. eleven that'll be judged. Um, so we're just building at the board right now to share with the judging panel, and um, different than last year, the judges will all do it anonymously. So last year they could see each other's comments before yeah. we added them up, and now and this year they won't be able to. So that's important, actually. Yeah, exactly. And then once we aggregate the totals, then we'll. We'll put those on the board so everyone can see the actual the actual marking. 
And so before the final event on June 7th, none of the judges will know who actually won and who's, who's the top submission. So last year, we didn't know truly who the contestants were, right? Right. And this year, we also don't know. Or the, or, or the judges can't can't like like you can't you can't read Ben Bogey's comment and then turn around and and use that to help l- the information you don't know what you don't know you don't know and what you know that's, that you that's kind of it that's kind of it so 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 let's say you you logged in and Christine Williamson Ben Bogey and Steve Basic all gave the wall a six out of ten for buildability for yes. whatever reason they evaluated. And before you read that, you think, oh, that wall is actually pretty, pretty innovative. I think it's an eight and a half. I bet you by looking at your colleagues who you respect their opinion, you go, ooh, ooh, maybe I'll, maybe like a seven, maybe it's a bit higher, right? I think it does influence your decision. So for yeah, that reason, totally. we're making it a bit more blind this year. And I think it'll be really interesting once, because we're doing the same thing. We'll take their numbers, we'll overlay them on the graphic, use their faces as their voting pool. And see the spread. Maybe it's the same as last year. They're very last year. They're very clustered. There might be more variation this year. We're not sure. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, you remove, you remove the bias, right? It's yeah. the, well, the, actually the bias is based off of people's ability and experience, but it's not. That's right. That's right. Transcend. You know, um, Connor, with that situation that you're doing, even though these judges are picked. You're kind of doing something that Barbara Check and I were talking about years ago, which is I really would love to have is crowd grading. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't understand why I grade anything. Like, I, I sit every time I grade something, I'm like, why am I grading this? Like, uh, this really should be graded by engineers, even their, their parents, invited people from the community. You know, I mean, what's what's the point? They don't want to listen to me anyway. You know, I'm their coach. Well, you know, well, I can't I, I can't be their coach I, and their grader. Which I, am I? <laughs> I think if you've got a rubric that's descriptive enough with you know levels of performance for each criteria, anyone should be able to use that rubric to to grade to grade work. Yeah. And if your students really thrive on feedback, and if if they respect someone's opinion, you bring in as an expert. They're going to listen to that person and that person can then use a rubric and then grade it and get feedback. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. And the thing is with the kids, it's, it's, you could be the best teacher on the planet. It doesn't matter. Eventually they're comfortable with you, especially at the high school level. You know, they're, they just get comfy, you know, and it they're like, in, it happens in college too. It's the same. Oh yeah. So, so like, yeah. So they're not going to, you know, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, they're not listening to you at some point because you become, <laughs> You become like a parent and you could tell a kid to clean their room like a thousand times. Eventually the kids going to be like, I'll get to it. You know? So it's like, it, it, you know, if you, if you are, if you're their, you're their teacher, you're also their coach. You're also their disciplinarian. You're also the, the, the person who sets up the room. And then on top of that, you're grading it. At some point they just tune you out, you know? What's that? It's an extreme bias. Yes, exactly. And then, you know, so, but I, I just stop. I don't grade anything subjectively anyway. So I got out of it because I used to, you know, like, oh, this is pretty good. This is not so good. I'm done with all that. So what I do now is just checkbox. Did you, did you do, uh, did you take the photos? Did you, did you try and target some sort of goal? Okay. Did you document it? Did you publish it? Done. Did you do it on time? Oh, is it day late? Point off. Boom. No talking about anything else. I'm done. I'm done. Sub- subjectivity is cleaned out from my entire repertoire. It's gone. Oh, look, we got Matt here. That's the German in you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I get real, real engineering. You know, I'm half Russian, half Hungarian, but I guess, I guess I'm right next to Germany anyway. All right, let's see. We got Matt in the house. Where is he? He's coming in. The computer's lagging here. Matt! <laughs> What's up? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Welcome to the show. 
I gotta turn you guys up. That that is the face of a teacher whose students are already on summer break. That's that face right there. <laughs> no, our seniors are on summer break, but I am not, or the juniors are not. Oh, the seniors get out early. Yeah, they probably went to their prom and they're done anyway. There is a point where there's they check out, you know, even though they're there. <laughs> well, it's, it's called September seventh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so uh, we'll just Matt, let Matt settle in here. Uh, he's figuring out his phone. For what reason uh, you got super quiet? No, we're um, we're we're waiting for you because uh, it's good timing because um. We want to plug in your your house numbers into this very awesome uh, app that they made called Beam, and uh, what it does is it uh, it'll calculate your don't don't say it, Connor. Hold on, let me do it. Embedded carbon. This is not the carbon that you're going to use to heat or cool the home later. This is what the materials have in it. Not just that. The truck that it took to drive over there is calculated in. <laughs> this is what it costs you if there's a carbon tax, which that could be a thing, right or wrong. That could so, be a thing. so, so Matt Matt's wall has the has the zip R nine uh, on it, right? That we know that that's on there. Does okay, does this does this wall. have zip? Uh, Connor? That's a great question. I'm not sure. All right. We got it, it might be under sheathing. Oh, is that cladding? Is that cladding? Exterior walls is no. correct. It'd be exterior walls. Exterior walls. No, well, wait. That, uh, well, yeah, boy, you move fast. Sorry. Go. Uh, exterior wall cladding. What's the difference between cladding and. and I, yeah, I just saw it on there. It's the LP smart side. And, and then and then you moved. That's his cladding. It's the LP okay, smart side. Go exterior walls. So if you go okay. down from framing, you go to structural sheathing. Yep. It might be in there. Structural. So sheathing. there's gypsum, wood gypsum. boards. No. They have OSB, plywood. Okay. So go down. Maybe it's under continuous insulation. Uh, continuous. Oh, yeah. So go continuous. down past cavity. Okay. Oh, I understand. Down now. to. I'm still continuous. learning all this stuff. Continuous would be on the outside. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so oh, it doesn't have to be actually. Oh, okay. You can put it on the inside too. Okay. Yeah. All uh, right. Keep scrolling to see if we have a uh, Huber. What am I looking for again? It's not in there. This is really interesting. It. Uh, so, uh, the Huber does use the, the, the poly ISO, right, Matt? I always have to look it up and see which one. Do you remember Connor? Yeah, it, it's a poly ISO R9. So that poly ISO foam board, there's that, the R value of that is nine, uh, on Matt's. So like the way around it is it might be, so I think because they're using publicly available, product declaration forms if they can't get them from the hoover products and they can't publish that might be what it is so the workaround yeah. might be making your own product so we'd select um whatever it is a 716 or half inch osb and then we'd add an well, right R9. now he's already at the poly iso so we might as well select yeah. that at r9 okay yeah so throw Where's in r9 well you have to then select oh. okay hold on change that to nine okay yep. And then go down and change the poly ISO. So row 121. Oh, sorry. I, I, I get the wrong row number. Uh, go down. So that uh, row 131. There you go. Okay. And I'm going to put in 10 again. Sure. Choose your 10. Okay. That's pretty good. Okay. Good. And then, uh, then we need to go to the OSB. And that's half inch OSB you use, right, Matt? Or... 7 sixteenths. Uh, it's green, so I think it's technically 7 sixteenths. Yep. Red sheets happen. That was up here, right? 
Yeah, I've been a sheeting. Oh, here we go. OSB. Oh, yeah, OSB. And I guess you have to use half inch. Oh. There you go. Mm, pretty good. Nice. Uh, then go, while we're on the outside, go to the cladding and select uh, LP smart side. Is that how, how well we know your project, Matt. I know, right? I, I just so go down and change tabs. Oh, change tabs to cloud. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. And go go down to cement based. Uh, no, uh, uh, LP is L LP is uh, OSP based. Engineer. Oh, is it OSP? Oh, cool. It, it was right there. Keep In going. Factory. Whenever they mess up a piece, they send stop, it back. Stop. To all back up and recycle it and put it back in. No, it's further down. You just had it. You just the engineered wood siding is thirty. Yep, there it is. Oh, there you go. Yeah, LP L, LP Connor is engineered wood, and Hardy James Hardy is the cementitious based. Yep, correct. Yep. So does LP not make a cement based siding? No, they in fact they 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 shut down their uh, LVL system, and now they're only making siding. They're not even making their LVLs anymore. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know Smart Side was OSB based. That's cool. Yep. Yep. So if you ever have to carry it or install it compared to that other stuff, it's uh it's the way to be. That's great. Can you cut it with just normal tools? Yeah, is it, it prime? Is it and it's is it prime both sides? Uh, no, back is not primed, but uh, so, so what it is technically every fiber has been sealed. Sure. Uh, so, but when you cut it, you prime the ends. Now ours goes the diamond coat. Well, so, so yours that, is coated. So now ours is pre-finished with diamond coat on the outside. Now every time we cut it, we gotta we gotta paint. We use color match on the ends. Right. And, Fill it back up, uh, or I guess I should say anywhere you cut it. But the yeah. back side is uncoated, uh, except. But thing is, or it's not painted, but it is since it's all sealed because like every fiber goes through a treatment process. It's just embedded in resin, yeah, sure. So, it, like I said, if they mess up a piece, they just send that they kick the piece back in the hopper, chew it all up, and redo it. Yep. Wow. So the uh, back of his is not coated. Uh, everyone, but he has it standing off of the zip. His rain screen is sub, uh, allows that that LP to stand off. He uses the Bob Kelly wick right, and so technically, if water gets through the LP, the back side of of the piece still can dry, and the water could still drain out. So. It's not as big of a deal that it's not primed on the back because it, it will always have air movement back there. Yeah. Well, and the back side of LP isn't raw wood either. Right. Yeah. It's OSB. But it's it's, what it still it doesn't have a coating on it. It has a, a glue on it. But, okay, so I'm still learning. So this is the LP on yes. the outside. And then there's going to be a separation for yeah. air. That's the Bob Kelly wick right uh, sits there. And so there's then a membrane the plus some sort of, there's a membrane, is that? No, it's air. Oh. So oh. there's ribs, there's plastic ribs. Yeah. okay. And the, that has the air and the space, the standoff. So and think which... of it as like a washer separate yeah. from it. But where does the wick right go? Up In against the... here or up or after? In between the LP and the zip, but uh, but what side of the washer or the standoff? Uh, I think we need so, visuals. I think we need visuals, Mark. What? So so the way the way to imagine is imagine you've got a framed wall. Kind yeah, of you you sheet it. You sheet it flat with plywood. So you have a flat wall, right? Yeah. Conventionally, twenty years ago. You, well, even some people two years ago, you'd go and get house wrap, Tyvek, yeah, staple it to the wall, right? And that's your yeah. water control layer. You go to the store, get your vinyl siding delivered in a box. 
and you, you put it right on there. and you fire it right against that 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 WRB, right? You hammer the nails tight because that's what you're told. Heats up in the sun, it gets a big wave down the side of the house, right? And you go, oh, next time I'll I'll let the nails a bit loose. There's room to move, right? So you still have <laughs> vinyl siding tight against your house. Right. So if you have water coming in at the top, it really has nowhere to go. It often finds a way behind that house wrap. And let's now imagine you did not use vinyl siding, but you used a wood-based siding. And you nailed it tight against that house wrap. If you have water inside, you have vapor inside that wall, you have moisture, then you get rot in the siding, you get rot in the wall. So what you want is you want to be able to space that cladding away from that sheeting. So we call it a, a rain screen. It's really a, a cavity. So what you do is you take your sheeting on your house, you take your, you seal your house wrap or your WRB. Instead of putting your siding directly on, you take, you know, one by four. So four inches wide. Four inches. Yeah, basically just like we call it strapping. You nail that to the face of your wall vertically. And that creates basically these channels. And right. then your siding gets attached to those vertical strips of, of spruce or fir. There it is. Wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. So those strips, so Matt's using a, a non-wood-based product designed for ventilation, but you could use wood to create that airspace. So if water gets behind Matt's siding, it can run down the wall and then out the bottom directed by flashing. Likewise, if his wall has moisture and the wall can dry out to the exterior, it can actually dry into that cavity and then ventilate at the top. So that okay. cavity is, yeah. is really important. 100%. Well, my confusion is where does the, there's another, isn't wick right, like a membrane or something? Now, where you have your cursor, the white strip where you have your cursor. So that is the furring strip, or in this case, the product wick right. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. I thought there was another screen, and I was wondering where that screen went. Not in this case. Okay. Right. Okay. So, the, so the, the siding goes right onto those strips. You got and, it. And those those strips in this case, Ron, let's say that those strips are a half inch thick. Now the separation point of the zip, which as Connor stated is the WRB in this case, that is allowing that half inch air space behind uh, the LP. And I was caught I was caught in my explanation because Connor joined us on Saturday when we were talking about this and he brought up the point that rain screen is in fact a problem of communication. <laughs> and so I was trying to rethink of it and, it's and it, what what did we call it Connor the the dry I think we called it a, a, a drain and dry or a D and D. <laughs> Yeah, D and D, drain and dry. Yeah, love that. So it's kind of like an electric car, right? We we have this. We used to have an engine in the front. We now don't anymore. Now that's a trunk, right. but the term trunk doesn't fit. So now we call it a frunk. For like, okay, that makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. So when we when Matt's puts up that that strapping to create a rain screen. That's actually not screening out rain. The cladding is screening the bulk water in the rain. That is a ventilation cavity and a drainage cavity. It just has a term that tells you, oh, that, that's a rain barrier. Well, it's not really. Right? So sometimes terminology confuses us for what its actual purpose is. Wow. So those strips are considered a rain screen, but that is not a rain screen. That is a air separator in a way. Well, if no, water gets no, no, behind your cladding, it'll drain out the back. But you, the per, if all of your rain is going into that cavity, then you've got a problem with your assembly. Yeah, R rain, rain screen is inclusive of all those elements. That's right. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Your those, LP and your yes, uh, this yeah. trip and That's right. the, the what what is this uh, uh, the green? That's the oh, zip. Zip, which is OSB and some sort of barrier in combined, right? Correct. Zip, the, zip the, the green coating on the zip takes the place of other layers of products, which is an acronym of WRB, which means weather resistant barrier. 
So after the, the brain gets through the LP yep. and it hits the zip, the zip technically is your WRB. Yep. Wow. All those elements together are the ridiculous word of rain screen. This is why the communication, wow. it, it, it doesn't work. And, and this is continuous as well. Correct. Uh, Which is not, another. Continuity is a big portion of this, yes. Which is another way of not transferring directly to the studs. And then if you got T studs behind this, I'm assuming that's another. Of course you do. What do you mean, if you do? <laughs> yeah. It's another thermal break. There you go. Dude, I've actually, I found the ultimate thermal break. The ultimate thermal break. I was looking at it today. Straw. Huh? <laughs> straw. Oh. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm kidding. Yeah, well, a, th a straw a straw is not a thermal break. I know. That's, that's, I was joking. I was joking. Oh. This is me. This is me being slow. <laughs> um, so uh, this machine right here is the uh, is the uh, uh, the the um, flux capacitor. Yeah, this is the flux capacitor, and uh, this is the James Webb telescope, and it there's a 600 degree difference between. The sun side mm. and the and the and the, the reflector side for the and what they do is they pull these uh they pull this web out there. Not nothing to do with the guy's name, J James Webb, just happens to be a web. And then what they do is they um they pull this out and then they you see the separation of the layers right there. Boom. Those are thermal breaks. That's why it's there. It's a gasket, right? And a mylar something. There's there's nothing in between them. Oh, it's just creating air. Yes. Well, there's no air. Space. There's well, no space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see what the words don't that work. Does, that does break your brain, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. There is yeah. no air. There's nothing. There's space. There's space. <laughs> Literally space. You might, you might call it the final frontier. Well, <laughs> then there'll be beyond the final frontier. <laughs> Nick's hiding the grin. I almost got him to laugh. <laughs> yeah. So, but there's a 600 degree difference there. And they still got to cool down. Look at how that comes in. So oh, smooth. Yeah. Jeez, totally. we can't even get our windows to go up and down right. And this thing oh, goes. And those are convex or concave. And if they form the thing. And then I think the camera's over here. The thing. You know, the reflector. <laughs> but there's a thermal break right there. I was showing this to uh, a kid today because the kid works in print make, printing, believe it or not. And they do like political signs and whatnot and, and signage for stores and whatnot. And he's doing folding and cutting. And I was like, hey, if you ever, you know, you're having a good time, but if you ever lose motivation with this job, I was like, don't forget, they're they're folding and cutting at NASA too. I was like, if you know how to use the machines, because he's I was like, dude, they're actually and I pulled up this. Well, not this thing, this is the orbit, but um, I pulled up the, the telescope because I was like, hey man, learn something about origami and you could do something with it, you know. Uh, if there's aliens at all, this guy is going to find it because there's no obstruction. This is sitting in between us and the sun, this uh, telescope. Anyway, way off topic. <laughs> this is like, you know. That's fascinating. I think I just saw Tony Stark. Did you see that? Yeah, he's here. <laughs> he's flying around. But did you remember, Mark, was it... Uh... So there's a conference a couple of years ago, Fine Hill Learning had a first summit, and I think Peter Yost did a presentation. He started talking about, you know, why is it you can go to a used car lot, buy a 1970s Datsun, drive it down the highway at 100 miles an hour in the rain and water doesn't come in, but yet you go to a production house built last year and the window leaks. No part of that window moves, but yet we can't control water. So 
We can't talk about our homes being watertight, right? We're managing water. These layers are to manage water, and we're still dealing with it. Except you say that a nineteen seventies car moving down the highway can keep it all out, right? So That's a like, great the, question. The bar, the bar is is set at a point that we're still struggling to get there, right? So uh, uh, when when I saw Peter do uh, the home building crossroads uh, for Huber, he gave that exact speak, and he was he was basic. I don't know if he used Dotson, but he said yes. The the worst built car. 25 years later is better than some of our best built homes. That's right. That's how he says it. And uh, like, I, I remember almost wanting to jump out of my chair. Like I couldn't sit still after that because it was an epiphany statement. Right. Yeah. Um, Matt, whenever I say that, that's when Matt goes, I know what kind of student you are, but it was an epiphany statement because no clear language has ever been spoken in a world of bad language. Run that again? Wait, what? No clear language has ever been spoken in a world of bad language, right? It, it means that Dotson statement that Connor gives of Peter Yost is so clear. It's because oh. it's an analogy that we yeah. can relate to. Yeah. We don't we don't build a kit of parts like the automotive and 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 the plane industry and every industry. Um it also speaks to how I think we think we are really, we're building really profound structures now, but yet something that we really discard, a 25-year-old vehicle that we think is terrible, in many ways exceeds our own ability to keep water out, yeah. right? So we're talking about now about new concepts about air tightness. Let's now manage this new fluid. We can't master water, the solid stuff. Let's go to the gas form because we can do that for sure, right? And then, but let me... <laughs> How about we do water first? Let's get the water right and air tightness, and then we'll talk about thermal bridges, right? It's uh I think it's humbling, you know. Yeah. My Ford Ranger's got a leak on the top of the window. <laughs> he drives around with the tube of Lexel. I have a <laughs> I actually put black duct tape on the seal, on the outside of the seal. And it it worked perfectly, and I haven't had to do anything. So how do you get in through the passenger side? No, it's just it's literally I applied it. To, I I cleaned it up. I put some yeah. alcohol. I cleaned the whole thing, and I just put I put a black strip because it is a black strip on the top of the window, and then I put a black strip of duct tape, and I just pressed it down. And then did one more overlapped uh, layer. I haven't had a problem since. I'm good. Yeah, well, the gasket slightly dries there, and so you added, you know, uh, thickness to it, right? Yeah, the stiffener. Yeah, I just your... basically re redirected, I guess. Yeah, it's my uh, that's my LP. <laughs> Is your Ranger the single cab or the quad cab? Oh, god, or I the, wish I the, had like a quad. The cab I, got a, I got a single cab. <laughs> oh man, I love those trucks, love those, they're trucks. great. I bought it for one thousand dollars like 15 years ago. I had and the I, same I had the same was it is it the five speed? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I, it's, there's nothing to it, you know? The four by four went out on it, but I used it anyway. Oh. Six bags of sand over the rear tires to keep it going in the winter. <laughs> you got it. The only thing that you know, one time I had the 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 leaf spring shackle broke off the frame and it shoved itself into the uh bed but it came through like freddy krueger it looked like freddy krueger stabbed it it was like holy crap i didn't even notice one time i was looking at rear view and i was like why is the truck like this <laughs> Which is like so i i was we had a. Uh... I had a couple of I beams and C channels on it, and they were a few feet past the front bumper and a few feet past the rear bumper. I had I had a, a rack on there, oh, and I had to go up this one hill right outside of the of the of the steel place. And after that, there's no more hills that you call. It's like it's a hill because of a road. As I was coming back down the hill, I was on the brake the whole time, and all of a sudden the rack gave in 
And so oh. the, 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 the roof of the Ranger was the added support, but that wasn't my fear. My fear was now that my strap would be loose because the rack came down lower and the I-beams at sea channels were going to shoot forward right. and take out, take out humans, right? Oh, yeah, easily go through someone's car. Between that hill and the stoplight is about a two-mile run. There was no one in front of me. I pull up at the, at the, at the stoplight. Right next to me, of course, is a Chicago cop, which means absolutely nothing. They could care less. I get out. I tighten down the strap, give him a wave, and I tell you what, there was never so much water down my back. I was a sweat mess. <laughs> After that, I never picked up steel again. Oh, my God. Who are the cops, Jake and Elwood? <laughs> they were the same ones that were by me in New York. <laughs> I got cop tires, cop suspension. Uh, oh man, that's too funny. More stories. Yeah, but the water. So I just sealed it with duct tape. <laughs> duct tape. I'm gonna is. do the seal. I'm gonna do the seal eventually. I gotta do the seal, and I gotta do the floorboards anyway. Hey, Matt, um, send some zip tape. We'll get you some zip tape. We'll get you some zip yeah. tape from Chris. We should have Chris present one time. That'd be fun. About yeah. this. Can I use this? If Ron, oh, you got Lexel? Yeah, there. Just put some of that on there. Really? Dude, it's... it's this says it sticks to water. What the hell does that mean? That's impossible. <laughs> No water. Water actually helps it set up. Um, Are they joking when they put that on there? No, that's you oh. could you could you could you could be putting it on while you're taking a shower while it's raining. There's a video. I, I did it at the JLC. Uh, it's so easy to do. If you have a hole in your gutter and it's it's raining, you go with the Lexo, put a dab, hole stops. Middle of the rain doesn't matter. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Through through the roof, we'll do the same. It which is. Just the altered version of Lexol. Right. Okay. What, Mark, what, hold on, Mark. I'm what, more interested. What are you gluing together while you're showering? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark's a busy man. He's got to get work done whenever he can. <laughs> yeah. it's like that Seinfeld episode where Kramer watches his salad while he's showering in the colander to, you know. Yeah. My, makes... favorite, my favorite part about that story is when they're eating the salad. And he, he said, "You made that?" He said, "Yeah, I made it while I was showering." The lady said, the... <laughs> "Oh man!" Uh, that's Connor, you don't know this, but but Ron went to high school with that actor that played Kramer. <laughs> really? And my brother. No. <laughs> You know, there was rumors that the the real Kramer was around, and there, there's the guy. There's a guy that they based the character on, a real dude. Yeah. And um, back in the day, he was trying to kind of profit on the success or whatever. So he had some sort of phone number, and he would talk to you for a fee or something like that. But you could call him first, and we, <laughs> I don't know, I was like a kid or something. We called him. I was like, "Is this Kramer?" He's like, "Yeah." And I'm like. What? <laughs> it was crazy. I don't remember. What we, we talked to him for a bit. It was stupid. Yeah, this is back when you would call, like you'd prank call your friends or whatever. It was stupid. The Jerky Boys. Yeah, that was. Good. <laughs> um, I got a question. On what about on the? Oh, go ahead. Tube. If you put it, if you look in it or look show, if you can show it on the camera, there's like a little button at the very end. The red, the red, it. Yep, that in. So does everybody see that little red, that little button? That hole there. Okay, so that thing has a purpose. Oh, I know what you're talking about. So if you had that thing slid out, if you push it on your hand, it'll suction cup on. So everyone else's caulk at the bottom is flat. Whatever you put that pushes on there, it put it dimples in a little bit. And when you release the uh, button, the pressure button, it kicks out and sucks the caulk back down a little bit. And that's how, when you use Sashko products, you get no drip. 
They're oh, the you just got back from the Sashko uh, core thing in the Bajingi. Yeah. Dude, are you stoked? You know, I, I've, I've learned more about caulking in the last couple months, especially just last week in sealants than... Like it's amazing how much you, you may do something through your lifetime or your career and think, Oh yeah, I'm a master, and then you get the knowledge dropped on you and like, Man, I didn't know nothing. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Dude, I did so much things so many things wrong. <laughs> oh wow. Interesting. Well yeah, that, we gotta, I, that's I, not I, me. yeah. We'll get we'll get them on the show. We'll get Nate or somebody on the show. Yeah, Ron, cool. Ron, you met you met Nate in uh in Rhode Island. Oh, me? I remember when we were doing the show. He was the guy sitting next oh, to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's cool, man. Um, yeah, I'd love to have him on. That would be awesome. And then we could talk about this. I'll seal my ranger with this. Wait, wait, let me ask you a question. My fear is that I can't take it off. Can I, if I decide to, could I have, might have to replace a windshield anyway? I got a crack. But if I put this on, is it ever coming off my car? <laughs> Um, man, <laughs> I mean, not without scra scraping the paint, probably. Okay. <laughs> if it's on the paint, I mean, right. it's it's made to stay. Yeah, wow, you gotta use a die grinder. You, you can, it's almost like an adhesive. I mean, I guess that would be the case anyway. I'd have to clean out all the all the adhesive from this from the channel anyway, or whatever. Um, okay. That's cool. That'd be a good question to ask Nate. We can get Nate on here, and he'll he he's a, he's a good he's a fun one to talk to. But yeah, no, the Sashko trip was it was yeah. fun. it was amazing. It's the, the awesome company, True Work Clothing Company. Big fans of uh, trade education. Um, I got to meet and hang out with the CEO and marketing team with True Work. Um, very inspiring. In fact, we need to get them on the show. Yeah. Like, you, you listen to Brian talk, man. You 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 you'll, you'll go run through a concrete wall for that man. <laughs> like he is, he's he's a good one. Very like very passionate about the product and the trades and uh yeah, just uh yeah. I I, I told him when I when I, I was when I first met him, um, it was the very first night we were there and or I was there. I guess some of the other guys were there. And I, half the table, over half the table, is wearing True Work clothes just by coincidence and chance. Well, not really, I mean, we were all fans of it anyway. But just the, not not knowing he was going to be there for dinner. But um, I told him, I said, "Hey, you know all the high school football teams, basketball teams, you know they got these Nike sponsorship and Under Under um, Under Armour sponsorships." He's, I go, uh, "Building Trades Class should have a True Work sponsorship." And he goes, "Yeah, they should." He goes, "Let's get this figured out." <laughs> said okay yeah let's figure it out so that's awesome that would be so cool we're gonna do next year with true work it looks like so nice that's great yeah i mean uh the the, the clothing things in it like a real thing like if you you're tearing up your clothes all the time you need that i got some rip stop lately and it really helps like oh my god i, I can't stay you get one tear you catch one thing and you're like oh man and you got to get new stuff yeah. Um, that's cool. Uh oh. There's no T stud here. That's not good. <laughs> that's uh, well, that's okay. Yeah. All right. So uh yeah, it's getting later. We could probably end the recording there. I think we were gonna jump around to did did Duke want to show something tonight? Did you have anything? Got nothing. Got a new lathe, but that's at school. I'm not ah. doing this uh, podcast from my shop like Nick. Oh yeah. But maybe maybe <laughs> Nick can go over to his lathe. Point it out. It's over. Nope, that's the window. It's over <laughs> that little red one, right? There, right at the end of my finger, right there. That's one of my Penn State lathes. I have two of them. <laughs> is it? Uh, is it? Is it this right here? Uh, Duke, you got this. That's pretty cool. This thing right here. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's something like that one. What are you going to do? Are 12, you going to do 12 inch pens? I was inspired. 
Yeah. When Ron, me and you made the pens at the uh, Maker Maker Camp. Oh, yeah. I got that here somewhere. Hold on. I'll I was always that. nervous to do it with middle school, but then uh, me and you were able to make one. Oh, yeah. Was... And I totally oh. screwed mine up. And then I, I, was actually, always, I, I was always I, under the impression they didn't have that brass tube in the middle. So a kid was just going to take one of the uh, you know, lathe tools and just jam it into it. You have break in half, fly into a million pieces. But dude, that, that lathe, even if you do push too hard, the pen does stop spinning. Oh yeah, that happened. Why, why is it that Nick told you never to go near his machine again then, Duke? Well, we picked the, there's a big one. There's a big, there's a big tool we picked to use. He yelled at us like we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble. Cause I, cause I, I tried to make mine like really grooved, and Nick was like, "That ain't gonna work. Do it over." And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, "But well, I want to do it like this." He's like, "Come on, get real, kid." My my lathe, my rules. Right? Okay? That's the shirt you can come out with, Nick. My lathe, my rules. Well, he so I tried to push back on him. He's like, "All right, how are you gonna?" I think he asked me how I'm gonna sand. He's good. Go ahead, try and sand it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. It's impossible. Those dog dishes must be like 600 bucks with the live edge wood. Look at that. Oh yeah, Jesus. A nice man. picture of you guys, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. We this is great. How do those saws? How do those saws work? Not work. We saw them work, but like, have you changed them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. That's the thing. It's um. You use a ladder, you know. I, I personally use a ladder to do my first slab on a tree, but all these slab companies or these chainsaw mill companies do have a, a rail system that you can start on the tree, and then you see the rails that are riding on top of the, the flat surface. So you do your first slab, you get a flat surface, and then you do oh, that's how you do the spacing, and then it gets pulled by the cable. Yeah. Oh, oh! Is he winding it? Yeah, it's a it's a bolt winch. Oh wow! So it winds really up on cool. the. So it just goes. It's just like. And he's like, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're just holding your finger on the gas, and you're just cranking nice and slow, listening to the motor. If you wow. pocket it down, and you just stop cranking and let the motor catch up. I think I actually got a little bit of a. Nick, do you have one of them? Yep. I have a 42 inch bar for my uh, 70 cc, so it was a little much, but Jeez, it takes a lot of work. Can actually, yeah, but sometimes, like you see these trees fall, and you're like, "Man, I'd like to really make some slabs out of that." But then, like a mill, you know. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's all I got for you. That's the kind of audio I need to have uh, linked to my Zoom account. Every time someone starts talking, I'll just play that audio. It's like every morning with this in the suburbs, doing their lawn. Everybody's doing the lawn. So I tried a few years ago to get a, a Hudson mill which is made here in New York, they uh, were doing, they're willing to do 50% off any school orders. Oh, wow. And, uh, I put the purchaser order in and uh, they saw a sawmill. And my assistant principal at the time was like, I can't approve this. I'm like, Chris, and he has a, he's a farmer by trade. And I'm like, Chris, you know, I'm not going to let them use a four foot buzz saw. I'm like, I described it. I'm like, it's literally the bandsaw on its side. It's safer than the table saw. Right. Because you're in control. So, yeah. This is good right here. This is uh, Duke making something. Oh, we got a little video. Hey, Nick, with that band, the, like the one that's like bandsaw that where you crank, do you have to crank it and walk it? Uh, you. Or does some of the mills do have the. A hand crank and you walk, you know, as you crank it, it goes through the log, but mainly yeah. it's just a push. 
you know, oh, as, you, gotcha. as you add your option to get, you know, to get the, the better option further and further. Oh, this was my, this was my first attempt. This was the rejected. That <laughs> one. Want all that? <laughs> Nick, that was a, Nick was like, how are you going to sand it? I, like, oh, I don't know. Just, just hold the steel wool, right? That'll do it. I thought I was yeah. so clever. I was like, wow, look at this amazing thing. When it's spinning, it looks beautiful. When you stop, you realize how many little pits I had in it. It was all messed up. <laughs> That's how you learn. That's a nice yeah. jet, though. That's a nice piece. Wow. Oh, yeah, this is a jet, right? Is this the same size as the other mills or the other lathe? That's a 1221 jet. Oh. So you can throw a 12 inch bowl on that. When is Maker Camp this year? October 8th. October 8th? Yep. Columbus Day weekend. But there's there's something else this summer too, right? Yeah, there's a uh, the last hammer in is this weekend and then the timber in over the summer. And what part what part of New York is is the camp? That's skills. Um, in between New York City and uh, Albany. So yeah, that's why I just won. Uh, Connor, if the border, well, no, you'll be in school in October. Never mind. Uh, well, we have reading week. I don't know what day that wouldn't when that is. Let's see. Hammer in. I keep on talking to Matt. I, I think it'd be nice to have a, a maker camp uh, in Taylorville. It, it, there's, there's so much with the building trades that are there, but this is going to appeal to the, the different, uh, you know, the kids that aren't stimulated by everything of home construction. And it would also be a, uh, a place for people that have been following the Taylorville build for people to come and congregate, oh, right? Yeah, that's cool. Get a tour of the house, meet the legend. Just did uh, <laughs> uh, Dietrich just did one uh, a post frame on his barn. I, I wasn't able to make it. I forget what I had. Oh, it was uh, prom that weekend, and uh, I had a senior. My senior uh, Ella's stepdaughter was. It was a big weekend. It was busy, so I wasn't able to jump up, go up and see Justin. But he just kind of held like a mini. Oh uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, he's it, just north, he's just north of me by like forty five minutes. 15, oh wow, and, are you serious? I didn't realize that. Ron, do you want to end the recording before yeah. we start talking about these things? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, uh, all right, Shop Class Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This was a lot. It was awesome. Cool. If you made it this far, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make. I'll put this in the audio. Yeah, I get. You know, listen. I, you would think that people won't listen to it, but I listen to long podcasts. You just throw it on the dashboard and throw it in your ear, so you're driving somewhere. And I listen to podcasts all the time. You know, it's like something to do. You know, um, you don't like good stuff at the end either. Yeah, the good stuff's when people get rolling. You know. So uh, if you made it this far, give us a shout out or something. All right, talk to you soon. Okay, ending recording now.